So what we're going to do is it's a hot seat session. Uh, I'm going to invite one at a time people up here. We're going to get 10 minutes. You're going to be able to ask me your questions, and we're going to go through them as quickly as possible. And then we'll go to the next person and the next person. We've got an hour 30, so we've got 90 minutes. So we can do nine people at 10 minute sessions each. And if we run out of people, we will do more. I'm going to quickly grab my water. We were already talking, so let's jump back in first and get this going. Um, oh, walking straight into my camera. So come on up here with me and let's uh, let's get this party started here. Awesome. So you sell educational courses to in your local country to university kids, high school kids, high school kids, high school kids wanting to get into university in the mathematics realm. The question is how to you how to build a funnel and leverage Facebook to drive customers. Yep. So we're already talking, so just a little quick catch up. So his average customer value is about $50 per customer, and you're selling through a webinar. Yep. So most people use webinars for $249 to $495 products. So one option is test higher prices. Have you done price discovery? Have you tested 97, 147 before? Mm -hmm. So I used to run offline workshop at this price. Okay. That's where I got the pricing from. And also, I should mention the country is Poland, so the cost per acquisition will be like three times, maybe four times cheaper. Good. And there is literally no competition. Like Good. the only thing that people in this space are doing is like boost posts on Facebook. Okay. So we were talking. My first question is, who's actually purchasing, right? I think it's Mum's credit card. And yeah, yeah, definitely. So it's definitely Mum's credit card. But you're saying it's the kid's choice. The the students like they're. You have proactive students in Poland? Yeah, yeah. I talk to students and parents, and the usual pattern is this, that the student will choose the, either tuition or offline course, whatever online stuff, and then the parent will pay for it. And currently, have you sold any of these digitally at this point? Is this a new concept that you're trying to prove the concept, or do you have this out, you have customers, and you've, you've gone through the process digitally? I, were, I was only selling like those uh, $20 like automated courses, okay. info, like info products. But they never sold like the actual workshop uh, online. Got it. So a webinar funnel, obviously, is what you're shooting for. So you need to get the opt-in for the registration. Um, then from there, you're going to close them on the webinar. Is it an automated webinar, or are you going to do it every single time? Uh, every single time, I think, like because Live. it's very time specific, right? right? So most of them they will start learning uh, in April, and the exam is actually uh, in May. Okay. Uh, so there's like a, this one, two months window gap okay. uh, to sell to them. So I think I would run maybe free webinars that would be free. Okay. And then one series of the paid workshop. And so what is your specific question with all that kind of painted out? Um, so I'm guessing email wouldn't work as much to like get people to the landing page from the ads, like make them opt in, uh, direct them to the webinar. Uh, because in this process, they don't really use email that much, not that often. Uh, so I guess, is there any other way I could leverage Facebook, maybe Facebook Messenger, anything from your experience that like pops up to your head? So I think the Messenger ads are a good idea. So what are you, you're teaching on the webinar, right? Yeah. So free webinar reveals the secret to passing your blank course type thing. So you got to get that, that offer that hits that person. And then I think you need to find a way to get mom's email address. I really think following up with a parent is going to be the best long term because the parent's actually the person who's going to pay. Like really, I think that's who you're actually needing to sell, and you might need to go through the child to get the parent there. But you're at a discovery point. You need to discover how much is it going to cost for you to get uh, registration, and then you need to find out how many people are showing up from the registrations to the actual webinar itself, and then you need to figure out how many people you're closing from the webinar based on the registration, right? So if you get a cost per lead or registration of a dollar each. 50, half of those people show up and 20% of those people purchase, there's a lot of cost per leads going on in order for you to make an individual sale. Do you have organic traffic? Are you building out anything organically? Organic traffic will come in like six months. So, so it's, it's, it's going to be too late. I would, for this year, for this but year. not for next year. Yep. And SEO takes time. Um, definitely, I think a lot of power would be in creating the ultimate guide to passing this test. Is this a specific test for getting to university? For grad like, what is? Why do they need to pass this test? So it's the most important test they have in their educational path. This will determine whether they will be 
uh, in their heads whether they will go to a good university and get a nice job yep. or if they uh, go to the shitty university or not get into any, any university at all yep. and then be low lives. <laughs> so, I mean, at this point, I think you understand what you need to do. And there's no real full secret. Like, how much is a webinar registration from Facebook? Simple, clean landing page. Free webinar reveals the secret to blank. Enter your email address. Sign up for the time that you want to be on the webinar. You need to monitor what that cost per lead is because you're discovering everything. You don't have data to go back on. You don't know what your conversion rates are. You don't even know if this is going to work profitably. So you need to start running traffic. You're doing a minimum viable product at this point. You have the product created and you have until March to start building the list potentially. Do you see yourself going into other, helping them the next year? How, how can you help these people with more? Because my concern for you is a $50 lifetime customer value, like even with a much lower cost per, you're going to build a list, you're going to build a list of customers. How do you get that lifetime value up? I think that's the most important question. And that, that's something for you to figure out because you know Poland, you know your educational system, you know where these kids are going next. If they go to university, what other things are they going to need help with? And when you figure that out, these metrics on the front end only have to break even. And when you get to where these only need to break even, it's going to give you breathing room. So if I were in your shoes, I would start creating some ultimate guide posts, some really big posts to helping the students create, to, to helping students pass like ultimate study guides for this. And obviously those study guides have pop-ups that promote your webinar, but it's going to be seasonal. So this is going to turn on and then it's going to turn off. How can you sell to these people throughout the rest of the year? That's going to be the biggest thing. But really like I think running, you're going to run to a webinar registration page. You're going to monitor your cost per new registration. You're going to monitor how many of those registrations actually show up. And then you're going to monitor how many of those who show up actually purchase. When you have all those data points, it's simple math. I put in this many dollars, I made this many dollars or euros or whatever it is, right? Like, but until you have that data, there's no real way to, to know what's going to happen. So you, you need to kind of set your own personal baseline. And then once you run this through the Facebook stuff, then you can kind of multiply it out, duplicate the funnel out for your SEO, and then you can monitor how much, what your numbers are on SEO. And then you can see what ultimately is going to give you the cost, best cost per customer. And then always, I think the biggest thing is how do you increase that lifetime value? And that's not a, how can I get more money from these people? It's okay. How can I be of service to this group of people? I've already helped them with a, they had a great experience. They passed their test. They love you. Help them with the next thing whatever that is. And when you figure out what that next thing is, and then that next thing is, and then that next thing is, that's how you turn this into a business that could be year round, big time cash flow, And all you need this front end webinar to do is break even. And once you have that dialed and you make all your money on the back end, it, it's, that's a business, right? This is a product. You're talking about a product. You, this is not a business that you're looking to build right yet. This is a product, which is great. So how do you turn this into a business line? Yep, that's going to be a challenge. There's no shortcuts either. It's, it's a lot of testing and it's a lot of tracking. Just make sure you're measuring and tracking everything. But once you get those numbers, there's your baseline. Then you start split, tweaking things and, and see if you can increase your or decrease your cost per lead, increase your conversion rate, right? There's a lot of things. Um, Russell Brunson's uh, webinar scripts, um, perfect webinar script. Have you heard of that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Use that. Definitely use that. Have the three bonuses. Do the value stack slide. Do your education, but really hit what he does on the back end. That works. I know several people who use that in several markets really successfully. Um, so, so that will work. I, I'd assume. Um, you know, if you can get thirty percent opt-in rate, fifty percent conversion rate, to sh or fifty percent show-up rate, you could probably get twenty-five to thirty percent conversion rate. Anybody really good at quick math off the top of their head? Because there's, so you got to multiply out those percentages. Once you get that last percentage, that's actually your conversion rate on your clicks from Facebook. And those are the two numbers you need to monitor, but you have two moving variables in between. Mm -hmm. okay. What's that name? Russell? Russell Brunson's perfect webinar scripts. Okay, so. Exactly 10 minutes now. Exactly 10 minutes. Okay, perfect. Cool. And we can chat more if you catch me around too. I think it's a starting point. Cheers. All right. Who else is interested? You gotta be willing to be on camera on my YouTube channel. Hi YouTube. Hi. I wanna go. Hop up. Yeah. Ten? Yeah. So, How many other hold on real quick. How many other people want to come up and ask questions? Hands? Eventually? One. All right, ten minutes each. All right, cool, cool. So I would like to know specifics with the benchmarks for Facebook when you create a Facebook ad. Okay. 
So like, what is a good conversion? What right. is a bad? So because like e every single time I learn a new skill, right. I know in what like what's what's bad, what's good. Right, what's right, average, right. Where am I? Where am I on the range? Tell me your best worst, so I know exactly. If I'm on average, I know I have to make yep. it better. And if it's bad, I need to change the actual image or something else. Right. So, and we've already talked. So your funnel is simple. It's add to landing page, landing page for a free offer. Then you're going to follow up with a one-time offer. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to have a one-click upsell. Yep. OK, so you want to see a 3% click-through rate. Now, I'm going to give you two sets of benchmarks. Number one are your target, like long-term, I want to hit these eventually. So 3% click-through rate, that's not the all click-through rate in Facebook. That's actually the link click-through rate. Uh, see, that's actual people reaching your site, not just clicking the other things. Then you want to see a 35% conversion rate on your opt-in page. I think long-term, I think you should shoot for 40 plus, yeah. actually. And then a 2% conversion rate on your one-time offer will be pretty spectacular. And a one-time offer, you're talking That's about... That's the $7 or $17 first yeah. product you okay. sell them. Then your one-click upsell, I think you should be able to get that in the 35% range pretty easily. 35%. So 35% of people who buy the one-time offer upsell to the, to the one-click upsell. That's a really simple script. You just need to let them know that, that there's one more thing required. Like, so if I was selling a traffic course, I would say you know, my sale would be the traffic course. And it's like, this traffic is great, but if you're sending traffic to an untested funnel, it's never going to work. So here's my funnel course that'll give you seven tested funnels that'll make sure you blah, blah, blah. So it needs to be that next most logical itch. And the buyer psychology, once the transaction's open, the, the buyer psychology is so much more likely to convert after that. But again, it's only 35% of 1% to 2%. So that's like your, your long-term target. Short-term numbers, I think 1.5% click-through rate shows that you're on a good track. If you're below that, that's where you need to focus your attention. 25% conversion rate on your opt-in page. If you're below that, you're going to need, like, your headline sucks. Then you'll probably right start out, what's that? I'm all right with that. So okay, yeah. cool. So you don't need, that's a variable you can kind of let go of. And then the one-time offer, you're probably going to start out at, like, 0.5% to 1%. Um, if you're below 0.5%, that's that's a problem. Um, and I would I would consider doing a, a video sales letter that, that's yeah. like a Frank Kern style or um, VSLerator. Do you mm -hmm. know about that product? Um, no. What I know Frank Kern said that what converts the best out of all the videos is actually very good voice with black background. White so, slides. Yeah, yeah just, that's exactly just, what we do too. And okay. you can go through my funnel. I think I gave you access to that. And you'll yeah. see we use Frank Gurn's style. So the script I'm using comes from his mass control product. Yeah. But that's actually from that. Brent. You mean mass John Benson? Conversion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mass control was before mass yeah. conversion. Uh, John Benson's VSLerator. It's an expensive course. John Benson. Benson. If you look, I have a video on my YouTube channel called... Um, how to write a VSL or some just just if you search my YouTube channel on the the search thing for VSL, I, I give you access to his free training. He has a software that's two thousand, but but uh, he has a free training that you can get access to. I don't know the link off the top of my head. Great. And the last question would be, in terms of the budget, how I should put like should I put like fifty a day, a hundred a day, or like start small. Like so, if you could tell me like after X amount of days, if you get this result, I move to this, or I reduce to this, or I scrap this ad and change a new one. Yeah. So, could, could you so you need to know what your customer value is, right? What's your okay. front end customer value? Once you know what that number is, that's what you're willing to spend before turning off an ad. So if your customer front end value is like fifty dollars, and you're doing a five dollar a day ad set. You could run that ad for 10 days before you've spent $50. At that 10th day, you should have a sale. If you don't have a sale, day 11 is cash flow negative, day 12 is cash flow negative. So that's when you decide whether you're going to turn off your ad or not, is when you've spent as much as you would make for a customer. So, and if you want to increase your budget, multiply the number of ad sets you're marketing to. Mm -hmm. Test different interests. Mm -hmm. So because I've never done Facebook ads right. for my business, I don't have any data. Okay. So I will just select. How much is your front end product? Uh, 17? Yeah. 17. So, How much is your one click upsell? 97. So let's just use some really rough math. 17 plus 97. So the highest someone would ever pay is 114. Mm -hmm. And then the lowest people would pay is 17. If 30% of people pay 114, 
and 70% of people pay 17, you're probably gonna come in around 40 bucks. A day? That's back of napkin in my head math. Okay. 40 bucks. So you'd be willing to spend $40 on an ad set and expect to see one sale, and you're gonna move those numbers based on what your average customer value is. Cool? Cheers, mate. Yeah. Appreciate it. Would it make sense for the, for the example you gave next? Yep. Would you run it always for more days? Or would you, put, would you also put $20 in one day? Or how is the I do $5 per day per ad set specifically because if you say Facebook, here's $40, they're like, cool, they're gonna spend it. And they're not gonna, you're not forcing them to target it as effectively as they possibly can. Yeah. When you put the parameters and you really limit how much they spend, that's how you kind of force them for, um, to, to find you conversions. Um, so a longer length. So a longer length. More time, because you're giving Facebook's machine learning system more time to find you the right audience. Um, this is specifically with a website conversion-based campaign, is Facebook's gonna go out and I mean, two billion monthly active users. And you're saying, okay, give me everyone who likes Tony Robbins, 1.5 million monthly active users. And Facebook knows who converts a lot online, who takes action online, who clicks through to websites but they, they are gonna start your ad budget all over the place within the Tony Robbins kind of audience. And then when they find a segment of that audience that converts, they'll show it more there. So it can take up to three days for you to start to really get decent traffic um, on a website conversion-based campaign. Question, so you suggested that you spend 40 bucks for one ad set uh, to the gentleman, <laughs> Sorry. Yep, at $5 a day. Five dollars a day. So let's say if I have Five dollars a day on each, okay, not right? right? No, nope, five dollars a day on each, and then you let them all run for eight days, and then you see which ones brought me customers, which ones didn't. Okay. The ones that brought you customers, keep them, maybe increase. The ones that didn't bring you customers, you turn them off. So you take the budget from the ones that didn't create customers, and you apply that budget to the ones that did create customers. So you only put more money into Facebook advertising when it's proven to deliver results. So that's the goal, is like, okay, here it is, let's see what gives results, and then what proves. Yeah, another question. How do you select the audiences? Like, everyone needs to speak English. But so interests, speak, yeah. who already has your customers? Who has your customers? And, and just think of it this way. If, if Tony Robbins customers knew about me, they would love me. But don't use Tony Robbins because he's too big of an icon. So, so go deeper, but like it could be Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich. It could be Peter Thiel. Yeah. Like who already has your audience? And if so, they knew me. I know who, so perfect. do I just. Add them as an interest in the detailed targeting section. I just want to confirm, so I think you mentioned this in your talk, you've got, you said 30 ad sets. Mm -hmm. So in each of those 30, you'll have your basic targeting like English in the US, Australia, plus one variable like people that have read this book. Yeah, and don't use English. If, you're, if, you, if you want English, just use people in the US. Um, because some people haven't said that they speak English, so you're actually um, limiting your, your audience. So, so each ad set will be this one book, the next ad set yep. will be this TV show, yep. and that's and it could be dude's book, it could be author, and it could be his blog title, and you could test them all against each other separately. Oh, it's three different ad sets? It could be, yeah, yeah, yeah. everyone would be a separate ad set. Oh, okay. Because I've heard that if you put more, like, more specific, like, you add two or three things, it will cost you more, so... It can. So are you suggesting to have one ad set per one interest? interest? Yep, yep, and then you so duplicate them out cheaper. over and over. Uh, you're forcing Facebook to deliver you customers at the cheapest cost possible, and then you put more money in the ones that work, and you take your money out of the ones that don't work. I don't think we've talked. I saw you had your hand up for coming on, up here. You wanna, you wanna join? So it's a great question. Um, I duplicate my tracking. I set myself up as an affiliate for my own product for my shopping cart. So all of my links on Facebook are affiliate links. So when I go into my shopping cart, I can actually see how many click-throughs I got, how many sales I got from the affiliate tracking. It's not perfect, right? Because some people have out-of-date browsers and, and sometimes the cookies don't stick, they clear their browsers, or they'll be on their phone and then they switch over to their computer when they buy. So in my follow-up sequence, I also include my affiliate link as well. And then I, I look at the two numbers. I'm like, okay, Facebook says I got 10 customers and 350 clicks. My shopping cart says I got 212 clicks and five customers. Yeah. I trust this data. And eventually you'll see that Facebook's 80%, 90% of the way there. And you could just do the mental math, but until I know what the, the consistency is. Um, 
We're gonna we're gonna get more people on. I want to go through kind of deeper onto these. Okay. How are you? Andrea, nice to meet you. Andrea, <laughs> pleasure. Okay, so my question is more about branding with Facebook. Perfect. So my problem is this: uh, um, I'm starting an, an e-commerce. Uh, it's a grocery store. Okay. It means that there is a strong competition already there, and they have a strong branding. Okay. Okay. Um, so. Uh, does it make sense to start a branding campaign uh, before some performance campaign uh, on Facebook? Uh, and when I know that I have to transition from the branding right. to the performance? Right. Brilliant question. So the first thing I want to make sure is super clear. What happens in one ad set or campaign, the data from the tracking pixel does not convert to the other. Okay. Right. So there's a, some people teach that you have to season the pixel in Facebook, and that's a false belief. There's no such thing as seasoning the pixel. Every time you start a new ad set, all the data from the pixel for the machine learning starts over. So what you're asking potentially is more of a fundamental marketing question. Is direct response marketing more valuable, or is branding more valuable? And you'll get Coca-Cola is the most valuable brand in the world, is the most recognized brand in the world, and it is absolutely impossible to negate what they've created through branding. They used to put cocaine in their product. Probably helped people get hooked on their product in the early days. So this is where I think my wife and I are a great team. I could give zero care to branding. Okay. She cares a lot about branding. And, and she's always, so she balances me in that sense. To me, if you're gonna be putting money into Facebook ads, you need to make sure that money's coming back out at a very consistent pace. Or else you're not gonna be willing to, able to put money in you need a return on investment, yeah. right? It should be an investment in your time. Now, is there a value, a long-term value in building a brand and in the investment there? Possibly, how deep are your pockets is the question, okay. right? Like how much money do you really have backing you? I mean, are you a startup? Do you have a, a seed round and a round A behind you or no. are you completely bootstrapped? Yes. bootstrapped? So if you're bootstrapped, all right, grocery store, uh, specific physical area? Yes. Um, what do you sell? Everything? Um, like yes, specific uh, uh, gluten-free organic products. Okay. So it's hippie, like, crunchy food, yeah. my kind of stuff. And then, what makes you different from your your big branded competition? That's the difficult part. Good. So uh, it's it's difficult to convey. I I would say that of course uh, we are all on the same page. Okay. So we need to find some way of differentiating right. us. Uh, uh, it could be the price, uh, but yep. I don't want to be too high. You don't want to get in a race to the bottom yeah. because they have better distribution and they probably could get a better deal than you anyways. No, we have a better deal, uh, so okay. we can get better price. Uh, cool. I could go and undercut them, but uh, uh, I would like instead to move uh, to a more higher end, higher end okay. uh, things. I agree uh, with that move. So uh, how much traffic, how much customer, what kind of data do you already have? How? No. So you're brand new. Yeah. Okay. So. What I would, and what I would like to see is if you could look through your, your shopping cart and say, you know, we got a lot of customers who buy this and then they buy it over and over and over and okay. over. Consumable, because what that's gonna do is kind of talk into that same challenge is your lifetime value is gonna increase and you could potentially go cash flow negative on a new customer if you know that they're, every two weeks they're gonna buy more bok choy, okay. right? So then you need to find out what those products are. Like where's that customer? What's the highest value customer to you? What do they want and consider giving them a deal the first time to get them mm -hmm. to try your service and then you can retarget them you can do other things to keep bringing them back but if you have someone who consumes from you and i think your value proposition is probably going to be you're making it easy yeah i can click order from work it shows up the next day at home it's at my flat food's there it's it's simpler yeah. um so communicating that is going to be powerful but humans like deals Okay. Most people so, know how much they pay for bananas. Most people know how much roughly, anybody here in the store randomly walk around and just buy apples at $5 a pound? Like we know when we say price on apples, it's crazy. It's like, whoa, I'm not effing touching that. Okay. So you gotta figure out what's the best way to lure them into your ecosystem, into your transaction. From there, you can sell the value of the ease of continuing to order with you. Okay. But until they've made a purchase and gone through your checkout process and had a positive experience, they're gonna remain skeptical. Okay. So how do you lower that barrier of entry for them on the first one? Um, free plus shipping? Like I don't really see what, how many, how many units, how many SKUs do you have? How many products uh, do you have? 650. 650, um, perishable, non-perishable? Both. Both, okay. Um, you could consider running ads on perishable items when you're getting down to the point where you're like, ooh, I got a lot of carrots. 
I need to move my carrots. Yeah. You know, like, so that's one way you could leverage this to try to work within your business. But finding those, those uh, little hinges in your business that allows you to discount where applicable. Mm -hmm. Do you have a physical storefront also? No. Really? Wow, interesting. Um, what is going to be the easiest item for someone to purchase to have you ship to them to get that first customer value? So Amazon.com in the United States mm -hmm. is an obvious example of a company that's doing magical, huge things. They are notorious for going cash flow negative. Okay. Because they know that they can go cash flow negative on the first sale, second sale, third sale, then they get us on Prime, and then you're hooked on like, I need a new watch. I mean, the number of travel items I bought for this trip Amazon two day, Amazon two day, order after order. I did not drive anywhere. I'm in Sedona, so I'm kind of in an odd spot to go get certain things anyways. But like Amazon got me by being a better deal. Okay. But now it's ease of use is why I yeah. am still an Amazon customer. And um, what do you think about um, Facebook shop? I haven't tested it at all. I don't have a physical product type business. And everything I do physical, I go to Amazon because that's the giant in our area. I would say it's worthy of a test. Okay. And I don't have any data or experience with that personally, but it's, it's worthy of a test because what you need to know is, my question is, are user, is user behavior advanced enough where you're at for people on Facebook to be comfortable to buy things? I think yes, definitely. So then I think you have at least a, an idea of being willing to test it, but I would test that directly against a website conversion campaign mm -hmm. that clearly sells something that people want and need on a regular basis to where advertising it doesn't surprise them and that kind of bring them in. Okay. Um, because if you can find that, that entrance point, what's that first thing that they'll buy that they might rebuy over time, you could build a funnel around that. Okay. If you're selling everything, if you're trying to promote 600 products on Facebook, it's going to be a very difficult sell because indecision happens. Okay, but do you suggest to um, try to um, sell the shop or sell uh, specific products on Facebook? Personally, I would go to specific products that have either high margins okay. and lead and prove that they'll be kind of consumable based products. So because okay. you want something, to me, it's all about lifetime. And I would be willing to go cash flow negative on the first sale as long as I have a high likelihood of that person buying from me for years. Okay. Because that's an investment to me. Yeah. Putting money in today for a future cash flow. I wouldn't try to make this system cash flow positive on the front end. Mm -hmm. I would try to make it break even, cash flow negative a little bit, but you're getting customers. And then your customer list grows, and then you could build a relationship, and then. Because once someone's bought from you once, they're going to be more likely to buy again and again. Okay. And that's where you make your money. And what do you think instead of a strategy where you do some content marketing? Let's say that I sell um, gluten-free products and yep. so I push out uh, articles and information Absolutely. about gluten-free. Absolutely. I would be super aggressive with that at the exact same time, personally. Most of like I teach SEO or I teach Facebook advertising a lot. Most of my business comes from organic marketing. Uh, if you look at the Miles Beckler channel, my blog, all organic, most of what my wife does is through organic. Um, so I am, I love organic because once it's built, it, it keeps going okay. for life. And it's again that like I put in a lot of time, effort and money now for future results. It's that delaying gratification, but you need to see results quickly. Okay, perfect. Thank Make you sense? Much. Yeah. Cheers, man. Thanks. Really appreciate it. Sweet. All right. What? A minute and a half. Well, let's get. Let's just keep people. Who else wants to hop up and go under the fire? Has questions. Mike, can I can I go to, without disclosing my market exactly? Kind of? Sure. Yeah, we can talk around it. Like you're gonna be on camera yeah, for my. Right, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, we'll talk around it. We won't get specific. All right, all right. <laughs> so. You can right. What is that? How many spots in Black What's that? How many spots in Black I can't. I don't know the math on that. No, no, no. Well, he, his talk's going on at 2. So we have it until 2. 2.30. All right. Okay. So it's more of a big picture here is um, I have a market of about um, 5 million people I can reach on Facebook. I'm okay. familiar with reaching them on Facebook. Okay. Out of those 5 million people, about 500,000 can be uh, potential customers now or in the future. Okay. So... As you know, the rules of Facebook ads are changing very fast. Quickly. We don't know what the future is, is right. going to be. Yeah? Um, so I want to get in touch with these people um, to Facebook leads, get them in email sequences, okay. and get the conversation starting with, with 500,000 or 1 million people, right? Okay. I've got a few uh, tens of thousands now, but you know, I'm keeping growing this. So um, it's, it's more brainstorming. It's right. How would you... 
get that con get these five hundred thousand people in yeah. the, the, the cheapest way possible and get the conversation rolling right. with them. So, and when you say bring them in, you're saying from a lead perspective, bring them in as a prospect on an email list. Right. So I would I would have um, a, a Facebook uh, leads ad where, yep. where I say, okay, you are you have this mm, you are you are this in, in this market. Right. Uh, we have this. We're building this product, for, for example. Do you want to be part of the development of the product? You're right. going to follow the whole adventure with us. So that's really smart because people like to think that, that you're asking for their opinion on things. Right. I would think my brain goes to free plus shipping. What can you do that's free plus shipping that's really inexpensive and not even necessarily create it, maybe Alibaba it, but like find something that, that's going to get your, because you have fanatical audience. Right. They love what they do. They love what you do. Yeah. They love what you stand for. What can you sell that's $5 plus shipping? Uh, uh, I can't even say, I can't, uh, yeah. like, well, so yeah. what can you sell? Like stickers, um, things that would, like keychain, I think I'm safe saying keychain, yeah. like little tiny things to get them in as a customer. Because right. I want them to be a customer. You want right. them to pay something. Because yeah. somebody who pulls out their credit card versus somebody who just says, yeah, I want to help you develop this, this person's much more valuable. I so I would try to focus your energy on, like, what is the lowest cost, highest margin, front end thing you can sell? and then just free plus shipping that out the wazoo. Then if and when you have a container of products and you do a big run, you can add it as an upsell as long as you have it. Mm -hmm. So that same funnel is bringing in people and you can start to upsell them on whatever you have that's, that's next level. Um, and then you have, you have a certain verticals of brand and a lot of the people in your area, like they're very proud to be this guy yes. versus the, I, right. I do this, I don't do that. Like, oh, those guys, they're just, so, so playing to that a little bit. And I know you, there's uh, copyright, things and trademarks that you have to be careful of, yeah. but help them identify with your brand plus that thing that they love, because that's going to hit them on two levels. Yes. They like the idea, the concept, the the what you do, what you stand for, but they also really like their version of it, because I'm one of these guys, I'm not one of those guys. Right, right. right? And so I would try to find a customer thing. That's like a very good idea. And any other idea of how so, uh, you know, I, I think really like hardcore social media marketing, like how often are you posting on Instagram? How often, how engaged are you with your YouTube? Are you using the stories a lot? Are you putting out a ton of content all the time? Because I think a lot of your audience wants to live more vicariously through you mm -hmm. and building the audience in all of the different platforms is going to be a long-term thing. I think you can do that with your lifestyle or brand ambassadors. Who can you maybe give a bit of product to to get them really one of your brand ambassadors and get them to share your hashtag, your stories to where you can start to put their content out so you're not the only content guy. Yeah. You can kind of leverage other people for content. They feel really cool because they got some free gear. And But try to do that with people who have audiences. Try to do that with people who you can kind of like leech their audience. They're already doing what you do. They're not like the starting out people. Mm -hmm. And then you can kind of get into their audiences and potentially like the influencer marketing idea. Yep. But you have to be careful of the fake influencers. Yes. People buying likes, people buying influence yes. and, and trying to look like they have influence, but they don't. But you know who those people are. Um, the other thing would be contests. Run contests. So yep. when you have something big and it's gotta be big, thousand dollar product type thing, 500 like big stuff, run a contest and I think for you more of where the conversations are held would be a good place to run these contests. Give it all away for free, but have them, they have to go through and they have to sign up, right. name, email address, address. Get their physical address in the, in the actual contest submission because then at some point in the future you might do a direct mail campaign. You might send, do you know what a maglog is? No. So it's a magazine that reads like a catalog. And it looks like a magazine, it's a full magazine, it's print, it's something someone would be proud to have on their coffee table because it shows they're one of your guys, yeah. right? But then when you read it, every single article sells one of your products, an affiliate product, somebody, right, everything is actually selling. Right. So it becomes this big advertisement that gets passed around, it gets picked up, because they all have friends. People in your world, it's rare, well, lone, it's rarely a lone person, but it, it, they usually have a lot of friends and those mm. things can get passed around. And I think a big contest, because that can go viral for you. And on Facebook, you could do like a paper engagement type campaign yes, to sense. kick that forward. And that would be really, and then just be sure you exclude people who engage with the post. Mm -hmm. And that could really kick that thing forward. Um, but contests, I think, are that next level. So I did a contest, all free, all based on our organic traffic. I was getting leads for 11 cents each. And I'm ready to do another one, but it's I, I have nice. to ship a physical box of stuff and we get it from like five vendors and I'm in Bali, so I can't do that mm -hmm. right now but I'm gonna do more contests because that's the only way to grow the organic. But I would be thinking, how do I grow my organic reach too? In terms of, of uh, time scale, 
you you would have to get 500,000 people in your email list. Would you try to minimize the cost and get them in the next two years? Or would you be afraid of Facebook changing a bit in the next year or so and trying to get them as fast as possible and pay more? I don't like going cash flow negative, personally. Right. Um, so what I would look at in your business is, I don't know where you're, what country you're based out of, I don't know what your tax situation is, and I don't know how you're about to finish the year. But Christmas is coming up, if that's a big, idea, big deal. So a holiday, and we have uh, Black Friday, Cyber Monday coming up. So there's opportunity to run two big giveaway campaigns right mm -hmm. now. Give yourself a Christmas gift. Just enter to win and just dump your money in it. Because like sometimes I hit the end of the year, like November, December, and I'm like, I really don't want to show much more profit on the end of the year. Right. So I am willing to do a cash flow negative for a few months and just go overboard on right, building right. things for next year. Yes. Um, but I, I, I monitor that in a bigger picture. I don't want to go cash flow negative in the year and like obviously like life. So it, it, that that's kind of a deeper like look at your numbers and yeah. how good are you on your bookkeeping? Do you have a bookkeeper who runs everything? Do you, can you log in and see month over month I'm what you're you, doing? I'm with you on this. Like cool. now I have two months of a Christmas, yeah. uh, Christmas time spending. And I think it's a good time to dump. You are gonna have more competition, right? The big, the quarter, the fourth quarter on Facebook has a ton of advertisers coming in uh, from around the world right. and big corporations, a lot of corporations work that if they don't use their ad budget by the end of the year, it disappears. So they're like, whatever, go for it. So so the costs might may go up, but um, I would really work on a free plus shipping and a contest-based thing and do both aggressively. Uh, and contests would be a great way for you to launch your new products as you continue to grow next products. And, and keep in mind the, the time of year, right? So it's winter, like how do you help them enjoy more of what they love in winter with the gift that you're giving? You'll probably get a better response than a summer-based thing. Because mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know if you have winter stuff, but I know you got summer stuff. Right. Um, Good. Cheers. Excellent. Thank you. Brilliant. All right. Dope. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Who's next? Come on. Fire it up. All right. Well, we have 10 minutes. Okay. Um, first question is, for what and how would you use lead generations? So describe what you mean by lead generations. Um, so we did, so I did marketing for DMSS conference. Cool. Um, and there's this objective, right? That okay. Can use the lead ads. Generations. Literally lead like lead yeah, ads. Exactly. Okay, cool. And it didn't bring any results. Like, we, it was really bad. Totally. And it was really expensive. So I'm just wondering yeah. how and why. So just don't use it. Uh, I used to use it back in the day. I got good cost per lead. You don't own the customer experience. So a lead ad is a form that pops up on Facebook. They fill out those two things. And then there's like a little link that shows up. And it's like, do you want to visit their website? Mm -hmm. And a very, very, very small percentage of people say yes. They're happy in the Facebook ecosystem. Then they go over their email and they're like, what the fuck is this? And they asked for it, but they, there's no mental correlation that that's what that's from. So that's why it doesn't work, is people feel like they did something over here, they thought something was gonna happen on Facebook, they go to their email, all of a sudden it's like emailing there. So how I would do email, like, or lead generation would be a funnel, like an opt-in page. What piece of information can you give people that is going to be worthy of their email address, yeah. not a discount? It's, that's kind of the easy one. Like, hey, give us your email for 20% off next year. It's like, ah, like, save that card as long as you can. Like, there is a time for that, but what I would try to do is find out why people didn't go to DMSS. S, DMSS. DMSS. <laughs> so I would try to find out why they didn't go. Is it, um, they, are they stuck in jobs already? Uh, are they the employees of agencies and the boss man wouldn't let them go? Or like, and then if you can create a piece of content that solves that problem for mm -hmm. them, mm -hmm. then you can market that throughout the year and you kind of know that, that you're, you're helping you're, you're identifying people who are highly likely to take action, you're helping them solve their biggest objection, and you're building a relationship because you're giving them results in advance. Then when it comes time to ask for like, hey, come join us in a few months, the likelihood of them being willing to take action goes up significantly. Okay. Um, also, I would say sell your services to your list, right? Like yes. you're not part of that, but like, but like make sure you get that value on the other side of the list and, and be asking like, hey, who wants this? And, and start giving more training of what you guys are excellent at and, and break up the bits of the videos. And obviously you're gonna sell the videos on the back end, which is a, a great opportunity. Um, if you can find a way to, to nail down some, some people who spoke and maybe get some expert content or some bonus content to tack on to the $97 yeah. thing, maybe kind of even like increase the value of that could be um, potential long-term. Yeah. What else you got? And um, we use lead generation for to target journalists. Okay. Because we didn't get any piece of PR. Okay. And so we tried to take a list from 
write from journalists from I don't know Forbes magazine, whatever sure. magazines, and then we did a lead ad. Okay. In order and told them, hey, sign up and you get exclusive content. Okay. But that didn't. Yeah. And I don't know how. What's, so journalists are bombarded. Journalists are absolutely yeah, bombarded. Yeah. So one thing I would look at, were you monitoring Haro every day? Do you know what Haro is? No. So it's help a reporter out. And essentially, it's a, you, you sign up, it's an email list, and every single day, reporters who need interviews from experts are saying, I need an interview from someone who is in the digital, net, digital nomad space. And they're like, here's my biggest question. And the, the trick to get Haro to work is you have to look at it every day, you have to be the first person to respond, and it has to be effing awesome. It is so difficult. But when it works, you get on big publications, like real, actual, big publications. Okay. So it's help a reporter out, monitor that every day. I think it's got a morning and an evening email. S literally set yourself a calendar reminder for two minutes beforehand, so you're sitting there reading through it. You got to be the first person to reply. When that works, it explodes. Did you run like through PR Web, even like their their expensive level? Yeah. Did you? PR wire, you put one out, but that didn't yeah. get picked up. And the, the trick to that is finding something that's like unique or interesting, that not just like, hey, this is going on, because like digital nomadism is. I think I think we did one on um, uh, five best digital nomad conferences. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So and that's interesting. So yeah, I think getting the journalists in is an incredibly challenging um, focus. And I, personally, if I was to use paid traffic for that, I would go through um, LinkedIn. I would find them through LinkedIn, yeah. and then I would just be like, how can I help you? How can I help you? How can I help you? And, and try to give to journalists. So a journalist and an editor is, um, a journalist and an editor, when you make their lives easy, yeah. they love you, and they'll come back to you. Yeah. So if you send them killer formatted, ready to publish, copy edited, like it's, it's done, it's polished. They put this much effort, and they look good, yeah. they'll come back to you for more. And it, it's, I would yeah. really truly leverage Colin, leverage Colin. Like yeah. he is a gangster yeah, yeah, at really this sort of stuff. Yeah. And I think, he, I think he has a methodology of that cold outreach and that ping and like I need to do more of that too. Yeah. Um, but the Facebook ads, like, like remember Facebook is like, it's like the bar. It's like the water cooler. It's like the coffee shop. It's random conversations. And sure, the, the writer for the Forbes magazine does go into the coffee shop. But she's got her earbud on, she's got her phone here, she's got 19 things going on, she has four deadlines, she's stressed, she grabbed her latte and she's right out. Mm -hmm. They don't spend that much time. Us, we're on there. We're sharing selfies, we're doing that. So it's it's a different user behavior for, for the yeah. that yeah. side of it. What tool Worthy challenge. are you using for content? Um, like content marketing? Or, no, no, like the automation or the, the publishing, um, publishing planning schedules. Uh, Keyword plan or keyword finder, kwfinder.com is like my keyword tool. Um, that's it. I use my YouTube comments, right, for my stuff. I'm always looking, what are people still asking? And I, I always link them to stuff, but I'm like, what, what questions do people still have? And it's more almost of a mindset of I'm focused, this is my organic stuff, I'm focused on like who's my target market, what's their biggest question, what's their biggest problem? And I pretend it's a friend of mine, it's just a mate, and I'm like, all right, here's the next thing you need to do, here's the next thing you need to do. And when I'm emailing every day and like really keep that email frequency up, um, to keep that relationship strong and give a lot of value. Um, Melanie's kind of the same way. We think like that we have this customer avatar idea and we're just giving of ourselves to that person. Mm. Um, and then in like transitioning to our ads to keep it on Facebook advertising, like all of what we do on Facebook, we tell stories that, that help people feel like everything's okay in their life. Like, yeah, the world's crazy and it feels heavy at times and that's normal and like emotions are real. And that's obviously our niche, right? We're in a very uh, emotion driven niche, but like making them feel like everything's okay and then helping them on the path. Um, I would be really curious, like run a, run some surveys too. Really try to get, like try to get people to tell you like why, like your email list who didn't sign up, why didn't why did they go, come? right? Yeah. And be like, we want to help you get here next year. Like, why didn't? Is it is it because their boss said no? Is it because they couldn't get time off? Is it because they have families and you need to add this like family side, right? Maybe it needs daycare involved. Like, who knows? You you'll be surprised at what the results of that are, and then you know, here's the biggest sticking point people had. Answer that. Yeah. And obviously, PR is always a problem. We always need more reach. Yeah. Um, yeah. One more question. What's yeah. your tips on the ad copywriting? Are you because uh, I. I don't know, I struggle sometimes 
writing very aggressive call to actions yep. or writing it very subtle and be like, maybe they understand. So themselves. curiosity is great. Like leverage curiosity. Curiosity is what gets people to take action a lot. So so really making sure you're, you're using the curiosity side of things and extreme value helping people like there's there's some, something telling that's actually value here yeah and yeah. telling stories telling stories so we use our best advertisement is um like 400 words on top of the image and it talks about melanie's path of like really not liking her life the way it was going and then she found meditation and then she had some experiences and then mm -hmm. things started to get better and then kind of like do 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 and we tell this long story long that people relate to and when the when our target market relates and they're like whoa this girl gets me, or I'm going through that now. Da da da. They're they're emotionally triggered, and they're much more willing to commit. So, yeah. the way the ad on top works is you only get like three, four lines, and yeah. it says read more, and then you click, and then you get like 19 lines or something, and then you click more again, and then you get even more content. <laughs> Each one of those is an engagement, and if you can't get somebody to read more, they're not going to go to your landing page and opt in. They weren't even willing to read the rest of your ad, right? So, so like your engagement numbers, like really getting that content to, to suck them in and what's special about Bali. I think the Bali digital idea is really good. You know, the Chiang Mai, like, like Chiang Mai is, you're throwing rocks at Chiang Mai. <laughs> Chiang Mai sucks. The airplane noise, like, like really, like you have to choose, you gotta kind of pick an enemy and you need to differentiate yourself to like, we are different. Like the Balinese culture is bright, it's vibrant, it's beautiful. You have beaches here, it doesn't smell like, like you gotta, I would play that up a bit more and really kind of like uh, position, like I don't wanna say enemy, enemy is not a really good word, but like you need to be polarizing yeah. in that sense and really stand out as like, you guys are the only thing like this here. So it's, it is a communication issue. So we're, we're asking the right questions and unfortunately there's not like a, for sure this is the, the thing to do. Um, but I would monitor horror like would you right, right. Oh, hell yeah. At, at certain points I would in the email follow-up sequence and like, have, have you ever been to Chiang Mai? Like subject line, yeah. have you ever been to Chiang Mai? Uh, people will open that or thinking about going to Chiang Mai, like open that be like, did you know that da 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 and Bali is da 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 And how many people from Chiang Mai came out for your event? Fair bit, right? Like, yeah, and then it's okay to have love for both in your heart. And it's okay to write it in a way that you're not totally dissing them. Um, right? Like it's, there's room for both in our world, but it's uh, most people living in Chiang Mai need to do a visa run anyways, like time your visa run type stuff. <laughs> like time your visa run around this stuff. Like there's, there's all these little entrance points for people. Dude, seriously, everyone hates burnings. What, March and April, right? Like. <laughs> yeah, 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 maybe like 11 and a half months till I think about it again. Okay, cool. Thank you. Brilliant. Cheers. Who else wants to come under the gun for a question? Oh, come on. Yeah, fire it up. And so we're on 10, you have a 10 minute timer. Who's got us on the greater timer for the next... Somebody should be doing that. because I should finish up at 2.30. What time do we have now? It's 2. 2. two. Okay, All right, cool. Works. Perfect. Cool. So this is uh, the idea that I'm trying with in my mind is, and that I also discussed with Fred yesterday, I really want to start, um, oh, in general, we want to start automate, automating uh, lead generation for clients okay. for our agency. Gotcha. Um, which, obviously, uh, right now, we have clients from Europe, Australia, United States, and we could tackle all of this market. Personally, I'm super interested in getting some German clients. Cool. And uh, my initial thought was getting like German corporations or so, but Fred gave me the idea yesterday that actually like 40 to 60 year olds, maybe like small business owners in Germany might be a great audience to sell to as well. And I was now this is for your, for your agency? For, for agency, For agency, yes. for SEO, SEO exactly. pay-per-click. Focus on SEO for sure. Okay. Um, but the in theory, yeah, Facebook, uh, SEO, PPC, What's the yeah, easiest right. side of your business to plug people into? For you, from processes, SEO. SEO. Profitable yeah. as well, exactly. really good. So, yeah, so definitely the like, like so, focus on what works for sure. Yeah, focus on SEO and then yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see how does lead gen work for B2B? Right, because on. Because all the other products we discuss right now are B2C. Right. And I'm curious, like do people even, I mean I know there are all those like people like start your SEO business type ads, but right. do real people and real business owners actually get, a consultant from Facebook? Like, do you think that's even 
It's definitely possible, and it does. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, think of all the information products out there: how to run Facebook ads, how to run this, yeah. how to do that. Like that's all B two B. Yeah. We're all solopreneurs, small entrepreneurs, so that it does work. Um, I think you're asking a good question because I'm, I'm always like, what platform has your audience? Exactly. LinkedIn definitely has your audience. Yeah. I would really geek out on LinkedIn. I would go become experts. So if you are, like you obviously speak German, you're from yeah. Germany, like is there a German, German SEO group on LinkedIn? So there's, for example, there's an entire German LinkedIn. Okay. Sing. Cool. And only German speaking people are there. Perfect. Is, do they have groups just like LinkedIn yeah, does? Exactly. And is there an exactly SEO the group thing. already? Yeah. There is one already? Yeah. Are you participating in it? Are you publishing great content in it? No, I have so, to. So I started now. I started now, like maybe the last two or three weeks, I started putting out articles and stuff like that cool. because I want to build myself up a little bit. Yep. But and can you create your own group? I'm sure I can. So I would, I would really, I mean, I would participate in others, but you want to own the group because that's yeah. it's pure positioning. You're, when you own the group and they're like, whoa, she's yeah, the yeah. real deal, yeah. and give value because you're, you're going to find that it's like that water cooler idea. LinkedIn's much more the water cooler at the office, whereas mm -hmm. Facebook's the coffee shop or the bar. Okay. And, and we're there, but it's easier to give value to people on LinkedIn who are in the B2B world, and I think yeah. there's a lot of opportunity there. Yeah. And so many people look at Facebook as like, I got to be on Facebook. It's like, why? Your people are on Pinterest. Your people are over here. They're on Snapchat. Like young kids, 19 year old guys, they're not on Facebook. Don't waste your money, right? Yeah. So that's kind of one of the things is, is where are they? And using your strategies to prove your strategies is obviously epic. So like run the best German SEO blog ever yeah. and, and do what you do aggressively because there, there are a lot of people who see that and they're like, I want to has the results. I mean, this is not Facebook. This is more like strategy. So what I'm doing, right, what I want to do now is just build up a few case studies, like small small business owner's website who we gave the keyword research to and gave yep. the content strategy to, and now he's earning his niche. Yep. And then we also have a beauty clinic in Munich, and I think that could be a good case study for like localized SEO, and yep. that's even a competitive space, and right. you know, we're taking that over, et cetera, et cetera. So you're saying like having case studies of us working on clients is not enough, but we actually have to have our own blog? I, I would. I'm shying away from the content production. I mean, I get your point. I get why it's right. important. Right. But so you, you, to you me, that's a that's a pure domination move. If you really yeah. want to dominate the German market, like then then yeah. have the number one German SEO blog out there, um, or do it in a way that's so unique, or <laughs> do it in a way that's unique and fun, and somehow put you you get yourself to stand out in a fun and unique way. Um, could could videos work? Could YouTube, yeah. uh, like YouTube.de or whatever it is, like yeah. could you somehow, so, so go survey the marketplace yeah. and survey where you're at because hearing you say like, oh, fuck, I don't want to do all that content, that to me means it's going to be a drag and you yeah. know how long term of a focus this has to be. Yeah. And so make sure when you do move forward with that plan that it's in alignment and you're like, I can do that for six months. Like yeah. that, that would be fun Maybe for a while. Maybe YouTube. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, and the other, the other thing you want to do too is like niche down like we, Kind of sound funny. Want to focus on cannabis dispensaries in America? Brilliant. Um, yeah, it's lots of money in the moment. So totally. Um, how would we set up our funnel from Facebook ads to landing page to? Or again, yeah, is that Facebook ads or is that also LinkedIn? Like so, well, when you when you cross that line to cannabis world, like that, that's a whole different game. And I do think that that is it, like. Do you know if we can even put cannabis in well, our ads? I'm using cannabis as an example. Let's just say we want to target plumbers. Or yeah, so I think cannabis is a much younger demographic. You got, I have a lot of friends my age, we grew up, and that's they are so stoked on it and they're so passionate about it, and they're not on LinkedIn promoting it, right? They're, they're, they are on Facebook, they're promoting their stuff on Facebook. So okay. I think I would be very careful about the words you choose. I think dispensary is safe. I wonder how cannabis would work. It is legal in California for recreational use. I would read their terms of service and see if they say, do they consider it a drug or is it what it actually is right now? I know some CBD oil companies have had problems even promoting CBD oil, which well, doesn't if have... Use another example that was just architects. How would we create a funnel from Facebook ads with an architect to the yep. page to the next one? So what's the architect's biggest problem? What is their biggest problem? Is their digital marketing team performing properly? Right. Are they paying too much for services and marketing? Right. So I really liked what Keyword Kyle said. I got it, right? Yes. <laughs> So the, the like AA testing, right? So, so something that no one's ever heard of, and I don't know if you heard his bit on that, but like, so ask him about, but something that, that no one's else is talking about, because if they're already engaged with the digital agency and you present this new idea that like, are you guys, is your agency doing this, da da da? But you, you might be out of context at that point, yeah. right? Because you're on Facebook and they're like, man, they're like, I've been working all day and like I'm architect, and like, ah, oh, architect ads, like, 
oh, leave me alone. I'm just trying to look at pictures of the grandkids. So there's that kind of like figuring out where the best place to meet them at the conversation in their mind. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying test it and realize that that might not be the best um, mechanism for it. Do you know Jacob Poole? So kind of so Jacob Poole runs a fire or he ran Fire Gang Dental. He sold his um, he sold his stake in that company. They wrote a book, and the book is how to do marketing for dentists. And he went to all of the dental seminars, and he he would literally send away his book for free. I was like, dude, free plus shipping. Get him to pay at least. And he would just he would mail out a physical book that it says here's how to do the marketing for it. And they grew that man. So. First year I met him, he was at $600,000 a year revenue, 1.3, 1.6, $3.4 million revenue year three. So those were his growth numbers and he sold his stake out and he bounced on it. And all on dentists in the United States, all based on a book and his willingness to go to the local events and kind of raw, raw teach from the stage. I think it's also great for the Germans. The Germans gonna love to get a book. Yeah. Especially if they're older. So the book right now is your business card. Business cards are dead. Anybody's like, all right, here's my card. Yeah, come on. Like when you're like, here's my book. I wrote a book, and then you can get on the podcast circuit, and you're like, oh yeah, I wrote my book. Would you be interested in me sharing with your audience? And every podcast, that's yeah. the podcast circuit is now the old school book tour. Yeah. Authors used to go from bookstore to bookstore. Now we go from podcast to podcast, and that's how it works. So, yeah. and don't write it yourselves. Outsource it, right? Are you asking how you want to get leads from Facebook? Which are the well, we're just trying to figure no, out no, how no, we, 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 we want a new SEO client that is an art architect. We want to sell SEO to him. And we're trying to figure out how, when, so you what. So you want to sell your services to architects? Yeah, right. Exactly. We want to create an automated sales funnel that doesn't involve us. Right. Free plus shipping book funnel is probably going to be like gangster because then they're a customer. Even though it's a $5 customer, they're a customer. And you can upsell them right after to kind of increase your customer value. Yeah. Um, and you can just change the word from architect to um, plumber. And then write mate. <laughs> Pretty close to that. I would. I absolutely would. That would be my model if I was doing that. Cool. No, yeah, but, but what I'm getting is if we make a funnel where people buy the book yep. for digital marketing and yep. then maybe our upsell could be kind of a webinar on digital marketing where we teach them some stuff and then yep. maybe we can sell them on a consultant. Or it could be a comprehensive site audit. I think yeah. I would try to sell them a site audit personally because what that does is your product deliverable that you give them proves the yeah. need for your services. And then we can go Data. Kyle and make everything red. Say it needs to be fixed. Totally. <laughs> I, I really like that kind of approach. 10 minutes. That's it. High right. five. Cool. Cool. I think we got time for two more before the. Th th that's it. So, whoever wants next better get their hand ready for a quick response to the last spot. All right. So, my question is what would be the best strategy to attract coaching clients? Because in the past, I would do like freebies, so whether it's like an ebook or yep. a free video training course and send a dollar ebook and then mid go offer like okay. 27, 240. And now I've read Franklin's new book about attracting like high coaching clients sure. or con consulting, but that right. applies to coaching. So thinking, should I just go straight from like freebie to $5,000 like one on one coaching or should I still do? It's like tripwire, midcore, and in that process, maybe I would attract like not the right target audience for the coaching. Right. So I'm still in two minds because I'm building the new, new business, new right. project. So where are the people you're selling to physically? Australia and US. Mostly. Okay. And then what type of coaching? Like, is it? Um... It's coaching for women. It's like okay. health plus mindset. Okay. And who is there? Someone already in that space doing five thousand dollar client yeah, coaching. Plenty. Plenty. So, so the model's proven. So it's possible in yeah. your space. So you're asking how do you attract clients and then are you also asking if you should go high ticket or not? Or Yeah, so I'm like, should I go from freebie to $7, $100 and then high-end coaching or should I go just as Frank Kern now, like he's promoting this right. new model from my But he's Frank Kern. Yeah. He's Frank Kern. That, it's important to remember that Frank Kern is but Frank Kern. he's selling the strategy. I bought his book. Sure. That he advertised on Facebook. Right, right, right. <laughs> Which wasn't a free plus shipping offer. It was a paid book mm -hmm. offer. He no, that was actually yeah paid PDF. So right. that was like right. Book. So he's moving away from that. So studying what he's doing is important. Um, did you buy his expensive coaching? No. But you bought his ebook. Yeah. Okay. So you bought his tripwire, yeah. and now you're in his follow up sequence. Yeah. So be very observant of what happens from this point on. Save. Put it. Use Gmail. Filter out, add a filter, add a tag, take everything he does, click on every link he puts in so you can get on all the segments so you can really collect everything he's doing because like obviously reverse engineering the greats is super important.
It makes, so having really high ticket products makes sense for two specific reasons. Number one, it could change the numbers in your funnel instantly. So Russell Brunson has a $30,000 membership program. Frank Kern has a $25,000 mastermind. The Genius Network is 35 grand. And when you have one of those things, you only need one in 100,000 to buy that to change all the numbers throughout your funnel. The second thing it does is it, it really kind of like changes your positioning. And when you're, if you, so let's say you upsell me on a book, I buy your book as your OTO, and then you try the next sale, which is a $5,000 coaching package that's normally 7,500, but you're giving me to 5,000. I'm like, eh, I'm not ready for that, too early. But then when you sell me on the next email or in two days, a $495 coaching product, that sounds cheap next to a $5,000 coaching product. So it's kind of a price positioning tool at sometimes that you might sell one in, in a thousand or probably a lot even more than one in a thousand, but it puts you to where it, it's kind of a value positioning, a value proposition. Um, the ultimate answer, unfortunately, and this is like the worst answer in the world to get, is you have to test it. There's no way I can tell you. There's no way anyone in this room could tell you. It, you just have to try and see what actually works. I would try, we were talking about this earlier, I would try to chunk it out to where make sure you're hitting those little benchmarks. Don't, I don't wanna say don't. It's not necessary to build out the entire funnel to launch, right? Start, get that email opt-in rate going, get the email list going, build the relationship with the email, start to sell them $1,000, $5,000 coaching. Throw that out there and see what happens because it's just as easy for us in this digital world to create a whole different offer that doesn't negate that offer, but you're positioning it differently. Or maybe it's a 9.97 a month for six months instead. And so you can just keep testing until you find something that works and you're gonna need a lot of volume to run that through, yeah. right? So you're gonna need a large list. So then that question is coaching. How do you find those people? Um, I love, especially in your space, like. I like organic content and YouTube and I like Google and I like the law of attraction in internet marketing. Be the beacon of help for those people who are just searching and have a funnel behind you that is going to help people who want more get more from you. Um, that's how I built my, my channel just crossed the 35,000 subscriber mark in 14 months. Just giving it all away. And people are like, can I please buy something from you, Miles? And I'm like, nope, don't have any courses. Like, oh my God, I, I want, they're literally lining up with credit card in hand, wanting to buy things. Um, flying across oceans when I mentioned, what's that? I would buy it from you. Right, so, and, and I, if I ran a coaching, if I wanted to do a thousand dollar a month coaching, I could literally line up 10, 20 customers for that because I put so much value out in advance. Do you know who um, Jay Abraham is? I've heard the name, but I Okay, so Jay Abraham, everyone should get on his list. He is the probably the best marketer ever. Um, Jayabraham.com. And he has a, a link forward slash 50 shades of J. If you Google J Abraham comma 50 shades of J, he's abraham.com, I think. So he's old school from before the internet. He came up with the idea of, oh, it's gonna evade me. Somebody knows this. It's the value, it's the core idea is you have to give results in advance. It's the same yeah. thing Frank Kern tells you you have to do. You have, and so the question is what medium are you most comfortable publishing content in for an extended period of time to grow an audience and to be of service of that audience? Yeah. For me, it's YouTube. YouTube videos are easy. I love to talk. I could do this shit all day long. I love this. So for five years, I tried to blog. I tried to teach all this stuff in blogging and it was difficult. I never got them done. I, it just didn't work. Once I started YouTube videos, it became easy. Now I transcribe them and I have them turned in by other people who are good at writing blog posts and then it goes out to a pot. Like, so build systems around you and how you like to operate in a way that can allow you to just become that, that heartbeat. You need to be the lighthouse, nonstop, always shining light. You're the beacon of the light for this audience and then the wealthy, the people who want it will sign up. Um, I think the best funnel is to have all of it in there. You know, having the tripwire makes sense because you want to get clients. Having a book, to physical book to sell them mm -hmm. makes sense. Your tripwire could be a free plus shipping offer. Yeah. Um, targeting your people is pretty easy. Brene Brown, right? There's, there's, some yeah. big, there's some big players in your space. So I think a lot of the women who like Brene Brown, for example, they read books. They like print books still. So I think a free plus shipping offer could be a great opportunity. And then... 197 a month coaching, who knows? Who knows what it is? Yeah. Group coaching, um, I think is a great option as well because yeah. you can get leverage on your side. And another, thank you. Sure. And another question, like in that book that I recently read by Frank Kern, he tells like, 
he tries to convince most of, of the book that it's good to do consulting and coaching and have high prices. Right. But what I like is practical advice, how to actually find these people who are ready to spend a lot, understand the concept, but on Facebook ads, because I don't have much experience like right. Facebook ads myself, how to actually find these women who right. are ready to pay that amount. So, and I don't use many of the income targeting, home ownership targeting, kids targeting, those kinds of demographics, I don't use them. I've, found, I've tested them and when I, when I start to add too many of those, my cost per lead goes up a lot. So when we put too many parameters on Facebook, the cost per lead goes up. So who already has those women's attention is the question. Brene Brown, right? Interest-based ad sets focused on authors, blogs. I mean, do they like Marie Forleo? Or is that too far? Is she too businessy, right? So, yeah. so what are the other blogs? They probably like Mind Body Green, but you want you want specificity, and you want to do the research. Like the fact that I know Brene Brown means that she's not the best one because a lot of people know who she is. So you need to do the research on the yeah, audience insight like in tools industry, in that industry, and just thing, but... each one gets their own ad set and test them against each other. See what your conversion rate is on the opt-in, what your cost per lead is, and what your cost per new customer is. And then you keep the ones that work. And I'm so I've got like 30 ad sets running right now. And when I have a few days, I'll go put a list of another 20 or 30 people to test. And I'll add it. And out of those 20 to 30 people, 15 of them will get erased because they don't bring me sales. Five of them will get scaled up because they bring me sales. And the other five will be left running at $5 a day. And I'll turn off a few more. And then I add more. And then I add more. So I'm just always testing new audiences. So would you set up like a separate ad kind of for that one person? No, audience. I run everything through one ad. So all 30, 50 of these ad so sets point back to one ad. either or, or like both, all of them, like how? Each ad set has one interest. Okay. One so it would be Brene Brown, then it would be Marie Forleo, then it would be Tony Robbins, then it would be, you know, kind of out of ideas in that niche right here. Uh, Jim Rohn, whoever it is. And then so you're running all of them to the exact same ad because you want same campaign, same yeah. ad, same numbers. So the only variable is the audience. Do and then you, you can also see. Just put like country, age, uh, I gender. I do. Um, I do. And interest would that be four variables? So yeah, yeah. And th so what you want to do is keep keep all of your demographics the same. And I'm able to pull my demographic information because I have a very large customer list. I have twenty thousand customer email list. I plug it in, and I can go into the Audience Insight tool and see my my customers are, boom. So I do use the gender, but if you don't know, if you don't have data on that, I leave those parameters open and I let Facebook test the different audiences for me. That's what the website conversion campaign does. And then Facebook will tell me which one converts. Facebook will find the best conversions. And then when you have actual customer data, you know, thousands of customers, you can upload that and see what that customer profile looks like. Because if you're basing everything on assumptions, who you think it is, you might not be right. You know, it's yeah, it's it's the same idea we were talking about here. Like, I think this is what I'm going over here, and it's like, wow, this is working over here, and it's like, no, mate, that's working. Like, you know, so I like to leave the parameters open in Facebook at first to to get it going and to really see. Um, but if you know for a fact, like women, like you only yeah. work with women, then then of course, like tick and the women. How many ad sets would you run for one ad with one picture and the same copy? I've had like up to seventy or eighty running simultaneously at the same time. And what, one of the reasons I do that is because all my social proof goes to that one ad. So all the likes from 75 different campaign or ad sets are all adding up. So my ad that's really rocking right now has like thousands of comments, tens of, might be tens of thousands of likes at this point. Um, and that proof, when somebody sees that ad, they're like, whoa, this has to be something real. And they can read through the comments. Like if they're not convinced, there's, there's enough for them to read through. And I, I curate the comments. I go through my VA goes through every single day, and she removes the ones that are like, "This is a scam." You know, they, they pop up, but like you just you just curate it and stay on top of that. And so from that perspective as well, if you have 70 ads from 70 ad sets, five likes, six likes, three likes, so the numbers are going to be low, and then you have to go in and monitor the comments on every one every day. It's a nightmare, you know. So just point it all to one advertisement, and and if you need to split test ads, you you can do that too. But I think that. Um, Long copy ad, tell a story, zero to hero. Um, Russell Brunson's new Expert Secrets book, he talks a lot about the Epiphany Bridge thing. And I've, I've got a video on the Epiphany Bridge. Tell a story that helps your perfect audience member have an aha moment to where they have the realization they need your thing. Don't tell them they need your thing. Tell them a story that helps them have the aha moment that they need your thing. So for my wife, it was, 
her life was in the dumps, the relationships were failing, like things were sucking, and it just it wasn't great. I'm paraphrasing massively here. Um, and then she started meditating with angels, and then things in her life started to turn around. And so what we're doing is we're presenting a new idea that meditating with your angels is the thing, but we don't tell them that. We tell them a story, and they read it, and they're like, ah, I'm going to try this. And then obviously it's a free angel meditation that they get access to. And it's, it's a, easy enough for them to say, okay, um, and give that a shot. Thank you. Cool? That's good. Awesome. Thank you. Cheers. Yay. That's it. We're done. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.